here we are. This is Act 3. This is our final part. Um, and in many ways, the most exciting part. So much comes out in Act 3. So much happens in Act 3. Uh, Lady Bracknell's back. What more could you ask for? Uh, so I really hope you enjoy Act 3. Um, just before we start, I need to say thank you to a few people um, for allowing this project to come into fashion. Into fashion? Into creation. So, firstly, to everyone in the wonderful, wonderful cast. Um, I love you all so much. You've all given me so much love and so much time and so much support. So thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Alex Loveless, who was our course leader on acting and theatre making, um, who has given us so much support and so much help with this project. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without you. Also to the London College of Music, who have um, helped uh, with promotion of this piece of work. Um, and also to you guys for watching and sharing and liking and commenting and giving us some feedback is really, really helpful and really appreciated. Now coming soon we have a reading of The Boy Comes Home by A.A. A. Milne, so stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, and we'll also have some interviews with some of the cast and some very special guests about this production of Ernest. So until then, I hope you stay safe, hope you stay well, and please enjoy Act 3 of The Importance of Being Ernest. Act 3. Scene. Morning room at the manor house. Gwendolyn and Cecily are at the window, looking out into the garden. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? but I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. Oh, that's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly, it's the only thing to do now. Enter Jack, followed by Algernon. They whistle some dreadful popular air from a British opera. The dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr Worthing, I have something very particular to ask. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr Moncrief, kindly answer the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems like a satisfactory explanation. Does it not? <laughs> yes, dear. If you can believe him. I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer true in manners of grave importance style not sincerely is the vital thing mr worthing what explanation can you to offer me for pretending to have have a brother was it in order that you might have the opportunity of coming up to the town to see me as often as possible can you doubt it miss fairfax i have the gravest doubts upon the subject but i intend to crush them this is not the moment for German sexism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr Moncrief has said. His voice alone inspires absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which one of us should tell them? 
The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? Ah, an excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Your, Your Christian, Christian names, names are, are still an insuperable, insuperable barrier. barrier. That is all. all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going, going to be christened christen this afternoon. afternoon. For my sake, are you prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are definitively beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage, of which we women know nothing about. Darling. Darling. They fall into each other's arms. Enter Merriman. <clears throat> Lady Bracknell. Enter Lady Bracknell. The couples separate in alarm. Exit Merriman. Good heavens. Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weakness in the old. Lady Bracknell turns to Jack. Apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is intending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now as regards. Algernon. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr Bunbury, resides? Oh, uh, no. Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury's somewhere else at present. In fact, uh, Bunbury's dead. Dead? When did Mr Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed him this afternoon. I mean, uh, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury? Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean, he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. That is what I mean, so Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr Bunbury, may I ask Mr Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding, in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. Lady Bracknell bows coldly to Cecily. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Lady Bracknell crosses to the sofa and sits down. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. 
Jack looks perfectly furious, but restrains himself. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey and the Sporin, Fifeshire, NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs Markby, Markby and Markby. Markby, Markby and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Markbys is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation and the measles, both the German and the English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, I see, though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr Worthing. £130,000? And in the funds? Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady, now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any real, solid qualities, of any qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear. Cecily goes to her. Pretty child, your dress is sadly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous result in a very brief space of time. I recommend recommending one to young Lady Lansing. And after three months, her own husband did not even know her. Kindly turn around, sweet child. Cecily turns completely round. No, the side view is what I want. Cecily presents her profile. Yes, quite as expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. I don't care two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into that do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cicely? You may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better to take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily kisses her. To speak frankly, I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. A consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? 
It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is that I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Algernon and Cecily look at him in indignant amazement. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxinian. I fear there can be no possible doubt in the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire bottle of my Parel Jouet Brut 89. A wine I was especially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I have never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so yes, myself yesterday afternoon. <clears throat> Mr Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. This is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, I'm only 18, but I always admit to being 20 when at evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18. But admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it would not be very long before you were of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again. But it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in this point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which is many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not even be still more attractive at the age you mention than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for somebody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not actually punctual myself, but I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively, that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat an impatient nature. I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six trains. To miss any more might expose us to the comment on the platform. 
Enter Dr. Chasuble. Everything's quite ready for the christenings. The christenings? Sir, is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell will be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand then that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr Chasuble. I'm grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr Worthing. The savour of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been performed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I'm on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for one moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with her education? She is the most cultivated of ladies, and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. Enter Miss Prism hurriedly. I was told you were expecting me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for you there an hour and three quarters. Miss Prism catches sight of Lady Bracknell, who has fixed her with a stony glare. Miss Prism grows pale and quails. She looks anxiously around as if desirous to escape. Prism. Miss Prism bows her head in shame. Come here, Prism. Miss Prism approaches in a humble manner. Prism, where is the baby? Cannon stares back in horror. Algernon and Jack pretend to be anxious to shield Cecily and Gwendolyn from hearing the details of a horrible public scandal. 28 years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Upper Groveson Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts to the case are these. On the morning you have mentioned, a day that is forever branded in my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I also had a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction I had written in a few unoccupied hours in a moment of mental abstraction in which I can never forgive myself I placed the manuscript in the basconette and put the baby in the handbag but where did you deposit the handbag do not ask me Mr Worthing Miss Prism this is a matter of no small importance to me I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom, in one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. 
the Brighton line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. Exit Jack in great excitement. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr Chastable. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered a thing. Noises are heard overhead as if someone was throwing trunks about. Everyone looks up. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. The noise is redoubled. I wish he would arrive at some conclusion. The suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Enter Jack with a handbag of black leather in his hand. He rushes over to Miss Prism. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes, here is the injury it received through the upsetting of the Gowner Street omnibus in younger and earlier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by an explosion of a temperance beverage, an accident that occurred at Leamington. And here, on the lock, are my initials. I had forgotten that, in an extravagant mood, I had placed them there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience to be without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Mother. Mr Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? Unmarried? I do not deny that that is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. Mr Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady that can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid that the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algie's elder brother? Then I have had a brother after all. I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? Dr Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algie, you young scoundrel. You'll have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. I did my best, however, though I was out of practice. My own? But what own are you? What is your Christian name that now that you have become someone else? Oh, good heavens, I had quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, 
Had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished upon you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is it settled. Now, what was the name I was given? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the present moment recall what the general's Christian name was, but I have no doubt that he had one. He was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years, and that was the result of the Indian climate, and marriage, and indigestion, and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life, but I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. Jack rushes to the bookcase and tears the books out. M. Generals. Malum, Maxbum, Magley. What ghastly names they have. Markby, Migsby, Mobs, Moncrief. Lieutenant, 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1896, Christian names, Ernest, John. He puts the book down quietly and calmly. I always told you, Gwendolyn. My name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I remember now. The general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia? Frederick. At last. Cecily, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I've now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. End of Act 3 The importance of being earnest starred Marianne Kelly as John Worthing, Chelsea Sheldon as Algernon Moncrief, Anya Morris as the Reverend Cano Chasuble, Miguel Santos as Merriman, Siobhan Mary Jane as Lane, Max Bayford as Lady Bracknell, Francesca Provini as Gwendolyn Fairfax, Emily Thompson as Cecily Cardew, and Grace Tyrrell as Miss Prism. Direction was by Matt Battersby, who also read in stage directions.